Hi, this is the Utah State Historical Society's 68th Annual History Conference. I'm Holly George, I'll be hosting. Um, today we are talking about Bones in the Basement. We have R. Kelly Beck, Kate, Ho Kate Hovanes, um, Darina Kopp, and Megan Banton. All right, and we'll let Dr. Beck start. Perfect. All right, I'm Dr. Kelly Beck. Uh, I'm an archeologist with SWCA Environmental Consultants. I was the, uh, the principal investigator for uh, the project that we're gonna talk about today, um, a discovery of human skeletal remains uh, during construction at the University of Utah underneath the foundation slab of the George Thomas building. Um, this uh, sounds an awful lot like uh, a murder mystery. Um, it isn't. <laughs> it it uh, turns out, though, to be one of the more interesting projects uh, that, that I think really highlights the importance of uh, a multidisciplinary team to be able to paint a complete picture of, uh, of historical events. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, talking about the, the archaeology, the archaeological component of this project. Um, other presentations here in, in our, uh, our talks today, uh, Kate Hovanes uh, is going to talk about um, the, the history, the historic architecture, um, uh, really the historic perspective, the his historic document perspective. Um, uh, Dr. Darina Kopp and uh, Dr. Megan Benton from the Utah Division of State History are going to talk about the, uh, the skeletal remains themselves. And I think that through our, our uh, conversation today, our, our presentations, um, we're, we're, our intent is to paint a, a nice complete picture of this, uh, this discovery at the University of Utah. So with that, uh, let's talk a little bit about the archeology span and the project. So um, during construction, uh, underneath the old Natural History Museum, uh, at the University of Utah uh, after foundation slab had been removed from a portion of the building, um, some human skeletal remains were discovered on the, the construction surface. Uh, human skeletal remains and a number of historic artifacts uh, underneath the foundation slab. This is a very strange place to, uh, to find this type of, uh, of deposit, archeological deposit. Um, under the foundation slab. So it, it starts off here as a, a very interesting mystery. So there were, uh, in the course of the discovery, over the first couple of days of, of trying to get a handle on everything that had been uh, found underneath this foundation slab, uh, we realized that there were kind of three big classes of things that we needed to, to try to make some sense of. And the first, clearly, uh, was the discovery of human skeletal remains. Um, also, a number of artifacts um, in the vicinity. We weren't sure if they were directly associated with the skeletal remains or not, but, but uh, still coming out of the same construction activity, uh, a number of historic artifacts. And then lastly, um, in side walls of the construction trenches, we were able to see evidence of a midden. And a midden is... Uh, that's the, the technical archeological term for uh, essentially a trash deposit. So it's a, a changing of the soil color and a big increase in the number of, of artifacts and things like that. So we had human skeletal remains, a bunch of historic artifacts and the presence of midden. So uh, three things that we really wanted to explore. We uh, developed a, a strategy, an overall plan uh, to look into these things uh, and set up uh, three primary objectives. So the archaeological work uh, that we conducted was really uh, intended to address these three objectives. First, we wanted to recover as much of the human skeletal remains as possible. Um, that, in this particular context, in an active construction site, um, turns out to be, to have been, a fairly interesting, rather complicated. Uh, trash deposits are, are really interesting. Go to uh, 
on your garbage day, open up your garbage can, take a look, and, and what you can see is essentially the physical remains, the, uh, the physical history of what your previous week was like. And that's true for archaeology as well. So when we find these biddings, we're super interested in trying to figure out, uh, just try to get a close look there and see what sort of a story um, the garbage from the midden can tell us. And the last thing we wanted to do was to characterize the artifacts, the historic artifacts that were found uh, during the construction. So I'm going to take each of these in order here. The first is the recovery of human skeletal remains. Um, you know, as I noted, this was underneath the foundation slab of an existing building. Uh, Kate's going to talk a little bit about the history of the building. Uh, it had been around for um, pushing a century. So pretty old building. Um, and it was, the, the, the bones were uh, identified during construction. So we actually had uh, human skeletal remains that we were trying to recover from three, three different locations. Um, one here is the on-site spoils pile. So what this is, is uh, the, the construction equipment was excavating, scraping away soil and putting it in a pile uh, on site for it to be put into dump trucks and taken to another uh, location. Um, and there were, there were bones that we were finding in the on-site spoils pile. Uh, there were also on-site in situ uh, human skeletal remains. That's what the, the middle picture uh, is intended to show. Uh, those pin flags out in the middle uh, denote the location of uh, uh, some in-place bones. And then the most complicated, the most curious, is the off-site spoils pile. So during construction excavation, um, they needed to dig a big pit, take that dirt somewhere else. And when we visited the somewhere else, the off-site location, uh, and walked across the, the big pile of, uh, of sediment that had been removed from the construction site, uh, we saw uh, skeletal remains in that big pile. Um, and we needed to go through that to, to try to identify as many uh, cold remains as possible. So at the off-site spoils pile, um, we took advantage of some heavy uh, construction equipment. And what this photograph shows is an a, a industrial screener. Um, there were uh, big backhoes that would take scoops of the, the off-site spoils pile, put it into the mechanical screener, and uh, the mechanical screener um, shook the sediment and separated it into a large fraction, a medium fraction, and a small fraction. And we had archaeologists placed at the bottom of the conveyor belt where these three size classes came out uh, and uh, were there identifying bones. And we were able to recover, and I can't remember offhand how many, but we were able to recover a, a reasonable number of uh, remains uh, from that mechanical screener. screener. Um, so this you know, recovery of human skeletal remains, this really was the big primary mover for the, the project as a whole. Um, but I'm going to let uh, Darina and Megan uh, speak to uh, those human remains. Um, this is uh, just to give a, a snapshot of how we went about recovering those. Our next major objective is, was to investigate that uh, the, the buried trash piles, the midden. Um, so this is an aerial, uh, aerial image of the Crocker building um, prior to the beginning of construction. And uh, we have a, a couple, let's see, here we go, there's the cursor. This black dashed area is where uh, foundation had been removed, the former building had been torn down. Um, the hash mark area shows where we did our archeological hand excavation. Um, the black dots are the locations of artifacts, uh, primarily artifacts. Uh, and here is one of the midden locations. So this midden location is right along the wall of a gulch 
called Cottom's Gulch that runs down through the bottom of the University of Utah. And uh, that is pretty, pretty telling. Uh, SWCA has done several historic archeological excavations uh, along various gulches coming down out of the foothills into Salt Lake. And almost invariably every single gulch has some sort of midden along its, uh, along its banks. And this was no exception. Um, so that is, is pretty interesting. We wanted to know if the midden was associated with the skeletal remains, if the midden was associated with the artifact scatter. So it turns out there were two exposures of midden. This one that's here, that are, uh, along Cottom's Gulch, and the other that was exposed in these excavation units. And I wanna show some pictures of what those are. So here is uh, the mixed midden that was underneath the foundation of the, the, uh, the George Thomas building. Um, and this photograph shows really nicely what I'm talking about, what archeologists are looking for when uh, they're looking for a midden. Um, and it is this really dark, dark soil right here that my, my cursor is, is uh, circling with a lot of stuff inside of it. So down below was just sterile sandy sediment um, with no artifacts, no uh, skeletal remains, uh, sterile dirt essentially. And this is the artifact bearing midden. Um, so this was one of the areas that we really wanted to explore, recover artifacts, uh, try to understand what this midden was all about. Um, here in the other photograph, a little harder to see, but still present, Here's the bottom margin of a midden in that side wall of Cottom's Gulch, and here's the top margin. And it extends out this direction and gets fairly large right through here uh, on my back. So this was all midden and artifact bearing uh, sediment. So we uh, scraped off the wall, recovered artifacts, and, uh, and mapped this midden so that we could try to get a sense of, uh, of what these were all about. Um, it turns out that as we took a closer look, um, this midden uh, did contain a bunch of artifacts. The artifact assemblage from this midden was not substantially different from the artifact assemblage of this midden from underneath the building. And so we think that uh, in all likelihood, the, the trash, uh, disposal events were uh, likely related to one another. Maybe not at exactly the same time, but it was the same type of activity um, going on uh, to leave the midden underneath the building as what was happening against uh, the, the site of Cottom's Gulch. Um, but that really was about all we were able to tell from these middens is uh, that the, what had created them was similar between the, the two. Um, last thing I want to talk about here is the artifact assemblage. So what uh, sorts of things did we actually find, the, uh, the physical artifacts, out of, the, uh, out of these excavations? Um, we found uh, 351 uh, historic artifacts, an awful lot of ceramics, uh, different types of ceramics, some terracotta, uh, porcelain, um, whiteware, the, the most common, though, that is really interesting are here the, the crucibles. So crucibles are a, a piece of lab equipment that are used to uh, heat samples to super high temperatures and then uh, take a look at the characteristics of the sample uh, as they've been heated to, to high temperature. So these are very much um, laboratory related uh, artifacts. Some window glass, uh, other pieces of glass, Lots of metal, undifferentiated metal, some enameled metal, and some mother of pearl. Um, these numbers to the eggheady archaeologist are all super interesting. The pictures of them are even better. Um, so this is one uh, kind of a sampling of the types of artifacts, the glass artifacts that we were getting out of the midden and out of our excavation units uh, surrounding or in association with the, the skeletal remains. And uh, now just a quick look here at the picture. Um, this looks very much like a biology lab or a chemistry lab 
Uh, we have segments of a burette, uh, thin tubing, uh, liquid transfer tubing, uh, pieces of pipettes, uh, test tube, portions of a test tube. Um, these are clearly not uh, like household kitchen types of, uh, of artifacts. These are very much lab, laboratory related. But we did also oh, some other uh, interesting lab types of things, uh, chemical bonds. Uh, this one we were able to take a close look at and you can see it's, uh, it's labeling here. This is ammonium oxalate. But we did also find um, some things that look a lot more domestic, uh, domestic ceramics, things like uh, portions of teacups, uh, dinner plates. Um, and this is more the type of artifact that we have found in other middens in the, the gulches coming down out of uh, the foothills above Salt Lake City. So we have a preponderance of uh, laboratory material, uh, the artifacts, a little bit of domestic, um, but the, there is a mix. So remember our objective here, the overall objective is the, of the project is to understand the uh, human skeletal remains, why they were there, uh, and, and the, the history and the context of their placement, um, where they were recovered. So we wanted to take a look at the, the archaeology to try to inform those uh, inferences about the, the larger discovery as a whole. Um, and it's a little bit mixed uh, because we do have a fair bit of domestic uh, artifacts that not really the types of things I wouldn't really expect to find a, a fine teacup in a, a biology lab. Um, but the preponderance of our, our artifacts were uh, related to a laboratory setting. So, uh, you know, based on the, the, the weight of the archeological evidence, we're kind of leaning more toward the overall context being some sort of a, a biology, chemistry, uh, uh, educational lab type of a setting. Um, but this, the, the archeology, span uh, as I noted right to begin with, really is just one uh, small piece of this overall picture. And one of the things about this project is uh, that makes it so interesting, made it so interesting, was the opportunity to uh, collaborate and bring a bunch of voices in together to speak to this discovery. And uh, the next presentation is uh, Kate Hovanes from SWCA. And Kate's gonna uh, talk to us about the, the historic, the history component. With that, Kate, I will stop sharing my presentation and turn it over to you. Um, I'm just going to start sharing my, sc my screen. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, hello. Um, my name is Kate Hovanes, um, and I'm an architectural historian with SWCA Environmental Consultants. Um, I was one of the researchers and writers associated with the, the data recovery project, um, and I will be talking a little bit about the history uh, behind the remains in particular, but also just in general, um, about what we found under the George Thomas building. And for my presentation, I want to start out by positing a scenario. Picture this. You're a member of the University of Utah's faculty. It's the early 1900s, you're wearing a starched collar, and the University of Utah recently created a medical school. Life is good, but the students need cadavers to dissect as part of their studies. How do you get them, and what do you do once a cadaver has been dissected? These questions might seem silly, but in actuality, these underlie a lot of the research I did as a historian as part of the Crocker Data Recovery Project. What is more, they were questions that would have been at the forefront of the minds of many members of the University of Utah's medical school in the first part of the 20th century. For this presentation, I will therefore use the Data Recovery Project as a lens through which to closely examine these two questions. How were cadavers obtained by the University of Utah's medical school from 1904 to 1933? And what were the disposal policies and practices associated with the cadavers historically? 
Um, but before we launch into answering those questions, I'd like to provide a little background and context about what I'm about to talk about and about the project in general, um, particularly the history of the University of Utah's medical school. As Kelly has discussed, SWCA became involved with this project after artifacts and human remains were found under the foundation of the George Thomas building. And based on the artifacts, as discussed by Kelly, and the remains, which will be discussed by Megan and Darina, SWCA believed that the remains probably, maybe, might relate to the University of Utah's School of Medicine. The School of Medicine first grew out of the university's biology department. In 1904, the department began to expand its course offerings to include subjects such as history, histology and embryology, which would usually be associated with medical training and which proved really popular with the student body. By April 1905, the university officially offered a two-year medical course th through the Department of Biology. During that time, the university also began to provide laboratory space and equipment for medical students. Due to state laws dictating that a medical, medical program had to be under the aegis of a separate school within the university, in 1906, the university created a separate school of medicine. That same year, the new medical school received an A rating from the American Medical Association, which allowed students to transfer to other medical programs after completing the first two years of their education. And this rating, while impressive, would become a source of trouble for the school in years to come. A lot of the trouble stemmed from the lack of adequate facilities. In the beginning, the School of Medicine did not have a dedicated building. It was first housed in what was known as the Museum Building, now the James E. Talmadge Building, situated at the southeast corner of President's Circle. The building had previously housed the Biology Department's museum and collections, and its conversion mandated the installation of laboratories and their associated equipment. This arrangement continued until the medical school was relocated to the new medical building, now the Life Science Building, in 1920, which, with the exception of one year, 1907 to 1908, when the Human Anatomy Lab was temporarily moved to occupy the second floor of the Mechanical Engineering Building. During the 19-teens, the American Medical Association threatened to, and eventually did, reduce the school's rating from A to B. The, the university managed to secure the funds to improve the school's operations, and in 1917, it was returned to a Class A rating. The change in location to better facilities in the 1920s further addressed the problems that had plagued it, particularly the lack of space. The school implemented a four-year program in 1943. But enough background. We're administrators for the medical school and our students need cadavers. What do we do? Where do we start? Well, the first place we have to start is making sure that acquiring cadavers for the medical school is legal, which may seem like a silly thing to worry about now, it's obviously legal today, but was actually a significant hurdle for the medical school in its early days. In general, obtaining cadavers was historically a difficult or outright illegal prospect and often involved body snatching from other graves, although not in Utah that I'm aware of from any of my research. Um, after some well-publicized incidents of murder for the purposes of acquiring bodies in the early 1800s, many countries and states made it legal for unclaimed bodies from hospitals, prisons, and poorhouses to be given to medical schools. In Utah, obtaining cadavers for anatomy classes was initially difficult because there were no legal provisions in the state to govern how they could be acquired. In 1902, a bill was proposed by the Salt Lake County Medical Society to make it possible for physicians to secure the bodies of the unclaimed dead for dissection purposes, but the lack of a centralized institution to take possession of the cadavers stymied the bill, and it did not pass. During the early years of the medical school, there was therefore no legal mechanism allowing the school to obtain cadavers, but an existing statute allowed the county physician to dispose of unclaimed bodies, and conveniently, the county physician, Dr. Eugene Whitney, was also a faculty member of the medical school, and through a liberal interpretation of the law, the medical school was able to meet its need for cadavers. But this legal loophole wasn't a long-term solution. The dean of the School of Medicine, Dr. Chamberlain, prepared a bill for the Utah State Legislature granting unclaimed bodies that were to be buried at public expense to the School of Medicine. The state legislature passed the law in 1907, ensuring a legal source of cadavers. The passage of the bill, in, bill into law was not entirely smooth, though. The Salt Lake Herald reported that one legislator, Senator Miller from Washington County, spoke in firm opposition. I quote, it appears that Senator Miller visited a medical college once and some prankish student, at least that is inference from his remarks, jovially slipped a human ear or two into the senator's clothes. Despite Miller's objections, the need to rectify the legal issues surrounding the use of cadavers for dissection was apparent and the bill was passed. It remained the key source of cadavers until the 1930s or 40s, when a body donor program became the main source. 
So we, as administrators from the period from 1907 to 1933, now have the right to legally acquire cadavers. What now? Where do we get them? The answer is from three possible sources, the Utah State Prison, county and city jails, and local hospitals. Based on research using prison records, it is unlikely that the Utah State Prison was a primary source of cadavers for the medical school. The number of deaths was as a result, pardon, the number of deaths as a result of execution, illness, or injury was, for most years, extremely low. And many of those who died or were executed likely had family members or friends to take the bodies. Research did turn up two well-documented cases in which the state prison transferred cadavers to the medical school, but it's unclear whether those cases represented an exception, hence their unusual level of documentation, or whether more unclaimed bodies were delivered to the medical school and the two mentioned now are just unusually well-documented instances of the practice. Either way, it's clear that while the prison certainly did provide some cadavers to the medical school, it could not feasibly have provided enough to keep the anatomy program fully supplied. Other sources, such as local jails and public hospitals, must also have been used. Very few records exist for city and county jails and hospitals, though, beyond a limited number of news articles and recorded connections between the medical school faculty and the jail and hospital medical staff. In many cases, the faculty of the early medical school also served as public health officials, um, oftentimes in jail and at hospitals, which would have made it comparatively easy to obtain cadavers from these institutions. For example, Dr. William Calderwell taught a course in physical diagnosis in 1906 and 1907, while at the same time serving as assistant county physician. This presumably would have put him in a position to locate and access unclaimed bodies from county institutions such as the jail, morgue, or hospitals. So, we, as early medical school administrators, have obtained cadavers from one or more of several legal sources. It's time for our students to learn. But it's not smooth sailing. The propriety with, with which cadavers were treated by students was sometimes an issue for the university's administrators. In the early years of the program, medical students at the university were occasionally pretty flippant in their treatment of cadavers, presumably because standards of conduct hadn't really been firmly established yet. For example, in 1908, the Salt Lake Herald reported that someone, possibly a medical student, had stolen a cadaver from the pickling vat at the university and placed it in the chemistry lecture room. Another incident occurred the following year when a cadaver was taken from the anatomy lab and placed in the university president's chair. As with the previous incident, though, the prank was met with censure by most, most medical students. Um, and such behavior was not condoned, and the lack of other incidents that were recorded during this early period indicates that the medical school culture quickly shifted towards appropriate treatment of human remains. Okay, our students have respectfully dissected the cadavers and now have a practical understanding of human anatomy. Success! But now what? What do we do with the human remains? Cadaver disposal practices and the histor in institutions historically might range from somewhere from good to ghoulish, but unfortunately, or excuse me, but fortunately, the University of Utah's School of Medicine's policies were reflective of modern times. Um, the 1907 law that allowed the university to obtain cadavers also required their proper cremation or decent burial. There's considerable historic evidence, such as receipts and written records relating to the disposal of remains, um, that the university took this responsibility quite seriously. And furthermore, a crematory was, for proper disposal was built into the 1920 medical school building. As an administrator, we would make sure the remains were cremated or buried correctly, either by the university or by a subcontractor. Which is all good and well, but in relation to this project still leaves the question of how human remains came to be found under the George Thomas building. The remains were almost certainly legally acquired, but no archaeological evidence suggests that the human skeletal remains found beneath the George Thomas building were accorded a decent burial, and it seems likely that they were not disposed of according to university policy. So how did some of them end up under the building and in the vicinity of Cotton's Gulch? Physical evidence from the site and the historic geography of the area around present day President's Circle offer the best explanation. As discussed earlier, the medical school was housed in two buildings during the period to which the skeletal remains likely date. At the museum building, now the James E. Talmadge building, on the southeast corner of President's Circle from about 1904 to 1919, and then at the medical, now Life Sciences building, on the south side of President's Circle from 1920 to 1956. The remains were found approximately 400 feet from the museum building and about 350 feet from the medical building. The close proximity of the remains to these two buildings, in addition to the physical evidence of the skeletal remains that our forensic anthropologists will talk about, 
points pretty overwhelmingly to a connection with the medical school. The fact that the medical building had a dedicated crematory makes it light, seem likely that the burial episode occurred prior to its construction, and that the disposal of remains occurred between 1905 and 1920. Based on historic research, there are one or more periods in which the dumping most likely occurred. The first is in the early days of the program, circa 1905 to 1907, when the procurement and use of cadavers was of questionable legality. The dumping may reflect concern over the matter and a corresponding desire to dispose of used cadavers surreptitiously. Another possible period is 1907 to 1908, or possibly even later, when the anatomy laboratories were moved, um, such as when they were moved from the mechanical engineering building or to it. As materials were transported from one building to the other, used parts of cadavers that no longer served an educational purpose may have been disposed of in the adjacent ravine. A similar scenario may have occurred in 1920 when the School of Medicine moved to what is now the Life Sciences Building. The final potential disposal date is circa 1933 when Cotton Gulch was partially infilled. The excavations and other activity associated with the construction of the George Thomas Building would have presented a convenient opportunity to dispose of unneeded skeletal remains at a time when the disposal would not be noticed. Although given the ready availability of a crematory at this time, it is unclear why burial would have presented a preferable alternative. So there you have it, how to obtain and incorrectly dispose of a cadaver in Utah between 1904 and 1933. Although considerable documentation exists regarding the University of Utah's School of Medicine and its anatomy labs, it is difficult to draw any firm conclusions about how exactly human skeletal remains came to be interred under and around the George Thomas building. Certainly, the disposal of human remains there is not representative of historic cadaver treatment policies and practices for the university. It is instead likely that the presence of human skeletal remains, as with the midden, reflects broader historic cultural values about cadavers and death and trash disposal that simply do not align with those we hold today. No longer do we live in an era characterized by casual attitudes towards de dead bodies, such as the, that common in medical schools in the early part of the 20th century. While the discovery offers more questions than it answers, it still represents an important window into the history of the university. Thank you. And I'm going to hand this over to our forensic anthropologist, um, specifically Megan Now. Okay, let me just get this shared on the screen. Okay, um, so as she said, my name is Megan Banton, and I am a forensic slash physical anthropologist for the Utah SHPO office. And essentially, this means I'm someone that has a very specialized skill set that allows me to not only identify human skeletal remains, but to tell you important information about individuals that are skeletal remains. Um, so I can tell you information about their age, their sex, um, sometimes can tell you about cause of death, how tall they were, their particular ancestry, and I can tell you about pathology that's there. Um, and the research I'm going to share with you today is going to share um, information about the George Thomas Building assemblage remains and how they compare with particular historical documents, in particular those about uh, dissection. But before I start, I'm sure it's obvious, but I never like to assume there will be pictures of human remains in my presentation, um, so please be aware of that. <clears throat> As I already touched on today, um, historical research suggests that the remains found during construction were likely related to the early years of the University of Utah School of Medicine. Um, I'm going to start with a little background on the role of the Utah State Historic Preservation Office in this. Um, so essentially when historic remains are discovered on state or private lands, uh, work is halted and essentially my, Darina and myself come to investigate. Um, this is exactly what happened in this situation. The work was stopped, Dr. Kopp came to the site, and was able to confirm that the remains were indeed human, that they were historic, and they were on state property. Um, this is essentially all the information that we need um, to know that the SHPO office is going to be ultimately responsible for excavating and analyzing this, these remains and deciding what their future will hold. So during this process of excavation, important evidence was discovered from the human remains themselves that hinted at a medical connection. Um, this conclusion was established based on the discovery of a callot, or also known as more colloquially as a skull cap. Um, and this particular skull cap had cut marks consistent with a procedure known as a craniotomy. And this is where the top portion of the skull is uh, sawn off in order to expose the brain. And this type of procedure is most commonly conducted for the purpose of human dissection. 
And on the slide, you have an example of a skull cap um, that was found on the site. And we'll talk more about this procedure in a few slides. So after excavation, the remains came to live with us at the Antiquity Section Human Remains Lab, uh, where they could be further analyzed. Um, one of the primary goals in analyzing uh, the remains was to determine if there was any further evidence to support the suspicion that the remains were dissected um, in relation to the medical school. Which leads us to the research questions I'm going to ultimately share with you today, um, which focuses kind of on three lines. First, what examples of skeletal alterations indicative of dissection are present in the assemblage? What patterns can we establish from these alterations? How do these alterations compare to historical documentation about early 20th century medical school practices? And finally, what does the assemblage tell us specifically about the early practices of the University of Utah School of Medicine? So I'm going to start with a little historical context and information on the historical documents we use to determine skeletal alterations we should see represented in the assemblage if they were indeed dissected by medical students. Dissection of cadavers has long been, a, been considered an important part of teaching human anatomy to physicians. But as already mentioned today, a wider public acceptance of the practice and obtaining bodies for this purpose uh, was quite the struggle. Um, by the 20th century, cadaver dissections was considered an essential part of a well-rounded medical school education in the United States and elsewhere in the world. So dissection was expected to be part of the medical student's experience, in spite of wider reservations about uh, this particular practice. <clears throat> Being essential to the medical school education, dissection manuals were often published in the early 1900s, and these texts essentially present step-by-step -step instructions on how students should carry out a dissection, giving them details on how things should be cut and in what order this should be done to best view anatomical structures. Obviously, such a text is perfect for understanding the alterations we should expect to see in a skeletal assemblage associated with dissection by medical students. Um, in this presentation, the manual we are going to use as a, our representative example of these types of tests is Holden's Anatomy, a manual for dissection of the human body. <clears throat> this was published in 1901, and it's a very lengthy two-volume set, and it was found to align very well, in some cases perfectly, with the skeletal alterations we observed in the George Thomas Building assemblage. So we're returning to craniotomies for our first example of what we were seeing. Um, there's four examples of craniotomies in this assemblage. Uh, the example on the slide shows the posterior lower back portion of a base of a skull that has had the skull cap removed. Um, the example on the slide, uh, excuse me, we know that the skull cap was removed from the base of the skull through the use of a saw. And we know this due to the relatively smooth straight line that you see surrounding the upper region of the skull base now pointed out to you by red arrows. We also have where this yellow arrow is pointing an example of an incomplete saw mark. Bone does not naturally break in this nice straight line that you see here, so we know that a tool must have been used to achieve these marks. We know a saw mark is the most likely cause of this due to striations within the cut, which are characteristics of marks we see created by serrated bladed instruments like a saw. The area between the red brackets is also of interest. While sawing surrounds the skull, the broken bone coming up from the sawn margin in these red back brackets indicates the last bit of the skull cap was removed through breakage fracturing force rather than um, cutting. So going to the historical documentation, what does Holden have to say about this? Well, he says, to examine the brain and its membranes, the skull cap must be removed about half an inch above the supraorbital ridges, that's about here, in front and on a level with the occipital protuberance behind. It is better to saw only through the outer table of the skull and break through the inner with a chisel. In this way, the dura of the brain are less likely to be injured. The location Holden describes um, in this particular text um, it's a slightly higher um, than what we see in this particular example. However, overall, it is an accurate description of what Holden is describing. Of more interest, he mentions that the inner table of the skull, which is the layer of the cranial bone closest to the brain, be broken through with the use of a chisel, as this protects the brain structures from being damaged. And this is exactly what we see here in this example. Of uh, the majority of the outer table, the layer that, of the cranial bone that would be closest to the scalp, has been cut through, but the last bit of removal was achieved through breaking, um, which is the area you see here in the red brackets. And from this documentation, we can infer that the breakage seen in this example was likely achieved through the use of a chisel. 
Um, the final skeletal example I want to show you is a complete spinal column that was recovered that has had the vertebral arch, which is the back portion of the vertebrae, removed down the entirety of the spine. Holden says to examine in situ or in place, the spinal cord covered with its membranes, the arches of the vertebral vertebrae must be sawn through and removed. <clears throat> so this um, procedure that Holden is describing is known as the laminectomy. Um, which is a procedure where the vertebral arch of one or more vertebrae is removed uh, to give access to the spinal cord that lays within. And this is done by cutting through the left and right lamina. The cut locations on the lamina are drawn as red lines on the anatomical drawing you see on the left. The photo of this on this slide shows a close-up of the mid-lower aspect of the spinal column. Incomplete sawing at the right and left lambda ha lamina has resulted in the removal of the posterior arches of the spinal column. Had they not been removed, those arches should be present where the yellow arrows, like yellow arrow is located. Um, we also see incomplete saw marks, which are shown by the red arrows on the slide. <laughs> so moving away from skeletal examples, what are some of the patterns found in the assemblage analysis? In total, 14% of present bones and bone fragments exhibited cut marks and 15% exhibited saw marks. In the table, you can see the frequency in which these marks occur in each bone type. The processing of the remains appears selective, with some bone types being highly modified, while others are affected far less by marks. For instance, the innominate bones, which are your hip bones, um, did not have many marks compared to other types of bones, such as the clavicles or your collarbone, or the cranium, your skull, which had many marks. Within the bone types themselves, we also notice that marks were quite consistent in where they occurred, which left some areas of bone highly modified and other parts bare of any alterations. So what does this type of data tell us? Well, it strongly suggests that the remains did not have all soft tissues removed prior to burial. Instead, only particular tissues were removed. So they were cutting and sawing the remains uh, was very targeted. They were cutting with purpose, which was to only remove bones and tissues that blocked other anatomical structures of importance from view. <clears throat> Another thing that we noted was noticeable in the data was that the number of skeletal elements represented, representing particular body parts or body regions varied greatly. <clears throat> For example, there were more, identifiable, more identifiable lower limb bones, um, so <clears throat> excuse me, your femur, your tibia, your fibula, your foot bones, than there were for upper limb bones, so your upper arm bone, your radius, your ulna, and your hand bones. Um, this pattern suggests that the remains were buried as bodily portions as opposed to whole cadavers, which is where the documentation from the University of Utah School of Medicine becomes of interest. <clears throat> Course catalogs from the early 1900s indicate that the University of Utah School of Medicine typically taught six or seven anatomy courses, with the majority being focused on dissection of particular body regions. As one can see in the table, course section options included the upper extremity, the lower extremity, thorax, abdomen, and head, neck, and spine. <clears throat> These sections were taught across differing portions of the year during the autumn, spring, and winter. For example, in 1918-1919 catalog, the arm and leg were taught in the autumn, the head and neck were taught in the winter, and the thorax was taught in the spring. <clears throat> Given this body region focus spread throughout differing portions of the year, it would have been logical to use sections of remains for deemed necessary for a specific course. In other words, why use a whole cadaver simply for the purpose of studying the arm? In this suspicion that students likely dissected only portions of bodies in their courses appears to be confirmed by the burial context of the George Thomas Building assemblage. Um, as mentioned in the previous slide, evidence suggests the remains were buried as bodily portions rather than as whole cadavers. Therefore, the findings of the skeletal analysis of the George Thomas Building assemblage affirms the regional anatomy teaching methodology expressed in these early course catalogs from the University of, Medi University of Utah School of Medicine. So what did we learn from this research? Well, to me, I think there are three important takeaway points. Um, first, the medical students were not just cutting into bodies and exploring them. They were going about their dissection in a very methodical way, which, is indica um, which indicates that there was quality instruction being given. Most likely this instruction came from both their course professors as well as uh, the manuals that they were using to help them with their dissection, such as that of Holden's anatomy. Secondly, we learned that the skeletal data matches the documentational information from the early days of the University of Utah School of Medicine. The early years of the medical school adopted a regional anatomy teaching methodology. This methodology was confirmed by the findings of the skeletal assemblage. 
To some, this may seem like a small thing, but quite frustratingly, alignment between documented sources and archaeology does not always occur, which creates some issues when we try to interpret history. But since that is not the case with this assemblage, it adds strength and conviction to the interpretations we can make about the history of the University of Utah School of Medicine during this particular period, and in turn makes the George Thomas Building skeletal assemblage a reliable resource for future research into early 20th century medical school practices in the United States. And finally, something we have yet to talk on today, um, the techniques of dissection discovered in the documentation and confirmed in the skeletal data are still employed today. So the current manager of the University of Utah Body Donor Program states that the cuts on the bones are consistent with cuts we use today to gain access to deeper anatomical structures. For example, the calvera is removed to gain access to the brain and cranial cavity, a laminectomy is performed to gain access to the spinal cord. So what this sort of means to me, and a nice stopping, port for, stopping point for my particular talk, is that it appears medical students roughly 100 years ago had similar practical anatomical education to those of modern day students today at the University of Utah. So that concludes my talk. So from here, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Darina Kopp, um, who also works with the antiquity section or the Utah SHPO. Thank you, Megan. Um, let me share my screen real fast. Megan, you can stop sharing yours. Yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> Technology. There we go. There we go. Okay. So today I am going to talk about um, what we learned from the bone and especially what we did, what we could um, compare with um, the death certificates that we, we found for the um, individuals who went as cadavers for the medical school. Like Megan's talk, my talk will also um, have pictures of, of human skeletal remains in it. So let's begin. So Caitlin mentioned that in 1907, the Utah State Senate um, passed Senate Bill 18, which allowed for the unclaimed bodies um, to be used for the University of Utah Medical School. What this did, and what was really important to us, is this actually resulted in the place of disposition on the death certificates of these individuals to be listed as the University of Utah. And ultimately, this provided a very unique opportunity for us to compare the demographics of the skeletal remains that we studied to the um, demographics that we could obtain from the death certificates. So I'm going to cover that today. So first of all, um, Kelly mentioned this and uh, Megan mentioned this, but uh, let's go over the bones a little bit. In all, we had um, 1,065 bones and bone fragments that were recovered from the George Thomas building. Um, as part of our analysis, we um, developed an MNI, which stands for the minimum number of individuals. And that um, is based off of, we identify every fragment of bone to the bone it belongs to and the site it's from and the portion of bone that it's from. And by taking the largest number that we have, we know we have at least that of people. So this MNI for this collection was 11 individuals based on the upper right femur. So we know everybody only has one upper right femur. Um, and so we know if we have 11 upper right femurs, we have at least 11 people there, a minimum number of individuals. Then what we did was we estimated age at death, um, sex of the individuals, stature, ancestry, and looked at trauma and pathology on the bones. And what was interesting for us is when we were looking at this, um, of all the bones that we had, none of them that we could identify or estimate sex for were female or probable female. Um, all of the ones that we were able to estimate sex on were either male or probable male. There was a good portion, about a third of the bones that were the bone fragments were just too small and we weren't able to estimate sex on them. But of the ones we were able to estimate sex, 63% of those, um, they were male or probable male. The next thing we looked at was we estimated age at death. When we estimated age at death, um, we saw another very interesting pattern. So again, not all of them we could get a very tight age range on due to the incompleteness or the fragment, fragmentation we had. But 
44% of them were, we could say generally, were gen definitely adult skeletons, skeletally mature. 27% um, were younger adults, age about 23 to 45, and about 19% were um, older adults, 46 plus. And then we did have about 5% that were um, what we call a subadult, a skeletally immature person, um, of between the ages of 15 to 22. And so what this lets us know is we have at least one individual in this skeletal sample that was ages 15 to 22. Um, next thing that we looked at was we actually looked at the trauma or the health of the bones and the pathology exhibited by the bones. And one interesting thing um, we saw was that the fractures, specifically the anti-mortem fractures, anti-mortem fractures are fractures that occur before the person dies and have healed or are healing. And so we know this happened during the life of the person. And we actually had quite a high prevalence of anti-mortem fractures on these bones. You'll see the, the ulna here, um, a third of the ulna that we had. The ulna is one of your bones of your forearm. A third of them had anti-mortem fractures on them. Um, so the fracture levels that we saw were, were rather high. And this gives us a clue about the activities these people were doing. So these people were doing activities that allowed their bones to be fractured. And um, when we think about that, we think about people who are doing very physical activities, physical work, physical labor, um, working in conditions and areas where they were put into um, harm's way or into risky environments. So you can think about mines or you can think about railroads, that sort of thing. Something that gives them a little bit more um, chance of getting a fracture. And one good example of this is this. This is a hand bone. It's a left hand. Now normally where my arrow is right here, the thumb would come out. Um, I didn't put it on there in this picture because I couldn't get it to lay straight. But what you'll notice on this left hand bone is if you look at the fingertips, the middle fingertips here, you'll notice they're missing the middle fingertips. And you'll notice this is kind of ragged, but also healed. So this is two healed fractures where this individual had their fingertips cut off or broken off due to some sort of trauma, but then they lived through it and healed. And then if you look down at the palm section of the hand, you'll notice these bones right here are crooked, and all these bones are fused. Now normally, this should be eight separate little bones that you see right here, and they should not be fused together. So what this tells me again is these are very severe fractures to this middle part of this hand that this individual lived through and they were allowed to heal. Now the fact that these are so deformed, that they're crooked and they're coming up and they have large spicules coming off of them, that lets me know this hand and this fracture was not set or treated by a physician. Even at the, with the medical um, technology at the time, this hand was not incapacitated and kept immobile for very long after the fracture. So they didn't probably have medical treatment for this hand when this fracture happened. So that gives me a clue about the socioeconomic status of this person. Possibly a lower socioeconomic status, didn't have access to medical care. The fractures and the trauma to that hand itself tells me that this individual was doing something where their hands were put in a very risky situation. So you can think of um, heavy machinery that they were trying to reach in to clear out or something large falling on it and kind of crushing these bones and breaking them in this way. So again, it gives me a clue about the um, activities that this person was doing. The next thing we looked at was osteoarthritis. And we had very heavy loads of osteoarthritis exhibited by these bones. Now you remember, the big portion of the ones that we were able to age were younger adults. So even the younger adults that we had, had osteoarthritis exhibited. So for older adults, that's not so odd. But for younger adults, when we see heavy loads of osteoarthritis in younger adults, again, that gives us a clue about what these people are doing. So we get osteoarthritis by um, one, use of our bones. And if we're getting osteoarthritis in young individuals, that let us know they're doing some sort of 
physical load bearing activity on those bones to have them have that osteoarthritis. And you'll notice right here, especially the arm bones, 100% of the radiuses, that's another one of your forearm bones, and over 80% of the ulnas and um, over 70% of the humeruses had osteoarthritis on them. So these people were doing something, especially with their arms, at a very high um, um, capacity to make them have such high levels of osteoarthritis. So what did we learn from the skeletal remains? One, they probably were entirely male. Um, we know we had one individual that was at least 15 to 22 years old. The anti-mortem fractures suggest that the individuals could have been of lower socioeconomic status, that's from the untreated fractures we saw, and had a heavy physical or heavy physical laborers. That's from the, um, and the amount of fractures we had that we saw. Also, the osteoarthritis lets us know that these individuals were, their skeletons especially, were subjected to greater and or more extreme mechanical loading than what we aver norm normally see. So again, some sort of laborer. So now to, with that, that's a very interesting picture. But then once we bring the death certificates in, we can start to really understand why we're seeing this. So let's talk about those death certificates. Um, we were able to, we went and searched through all the death certificates, um, focusing on Salt Lake County and then going outwards um, from 1907 to about 1931, 1933. And here's what we found. So first, who went? Who were the individuals that the University of Utah used as cadavers? Well, they were unclaimed remains. That means they either had no next of kin to claim them or the next of kin did not claim them. There were times um, on the death certificates where they knew the next of kin, but they were unclaimed for some reason. So what we did was we entered all the data, the, especially the vital statistics data, off of those death certificates and um, compiled it. And here's what we saw um, for the sex of the individuals. 92% of the individuals who went to the University of Utah to be medical cadavers at that time were male. Only 8% were female. So that fits very well with our skeletal data. Um, another one is um, for age at death. We know that 53% of the individuals who went were 46 years or older and 40% were um, 23 to 45. And there were a small percentage, about 3% of the individuals who were in that sub-adult range, that 15 to 22 years. And then starting in about the mid 20s and going forward, they would take a few um, stillborn infants every year to probably do their embryology um, anatomy and stuff. So there were some infants that we also had. Um, the ancestry of the individuals who went, not surprisingly, 90% of them were what we would call white. Or, um, or European ancestry, 7% uh, were Hispanic and 3% were black. There was one individual who was Native American and two, I think, individuals over that entire time who were Asian that were taken, so very slow mo low amounts of them. Um, the birthplace was very interesting to us. So when we look at the birthplace, 38% were known to be foreign born. Um, only 25% were born in the US and then there was a large percentage in where they didn't know, they just didn't have the information about them. So that's interesting too, because that's showing that um, we have people coming to Utah to probably work from other areas and not bringing families with them so that they are then unclaimed. When we look at occupation type, occupation was um, not listed for all of the individuals we did have 38 percent where there was none listed or it was listed as unknown but for the ones we did have we saw that 50 percent were listed as what we would identify as a physical occupation the vast majority of those were miners um, day laborers um, general laborers railroad laborers that sort of stuff. Um, the non-physical was only 12%. Those would be clerical positions, bookkeepers, um, that sort of thing would be a, a more non-physical occupation. So this also fits very well with what our skeleton show. The skeletal remains showed that these people were laborers. They were out there doing physical activity with their bone, with their bodies, and we could see that on their bones. 
So we also know that we had at least one individual that was 15 to 22 years old, a skeletally immature individual. His bones were not done growing. We know he was male because we had the anominate and we could estimate um, sex from that. So then we looked through the years that we had and we had five years total that had individuals who were um, within that age range. And you'll see in 1910 right there in the middle, um, there's Anna Saylor, who was a female. We know we didn't have any females in this collection, um, especially the young, the subadult was not female, we know that. So we can take out 1910. So then that leaves us with 1919, 1920, 1923, and 1924. There were two individuals in 1924 in this age range. Interesting enough, if you remember the newspaper article that um, Caitlin showed, here's Mike Baca, the um, state penitentiary inmate who died. Um, he was about 19, they estimated, and um, he did go to the University of Utah um, to be a, um, a medical cadaver in 1920. So what did we learn from the death certificates? So first of all, we learned that our um, skeletal analysis was pretty much right on. We know they were mostly male that were taken up there, and that's what our skeletal analysis told us. Um, a vast majority of them, 50%, if not more, had a physical, heavily physical um, occupation that we could see in their bones. And then we know that there were five years that had this subadult individual. One was one year had a female, uh, the other four years had males. So we know that if these remains came from the time that we have the, um, we have death certificates for, we know that we can narrow when these remains came down to 1919, 1920, 1923, and 1924. Now, this kind of contradicts what Caitlin said. So what Caitlin said was based off of just her um, understanding of the movement and when it maybe couldn't have happened. Um, and so clearly there is something possibly um, going on. Now, these remains could have come from the 1905 to 1907 period, uh, the earlier period where we don't have um, death certificates for, but it does, we also can narrow it down and look at um, these years more closely and look at the individuals who were, we know were used it during these years and see if we can find any of these years um, individuals in the, our sets of skeletal remains and try and narrow it down even more or completely exclude these years. Ultimately though, what this shows is that this was such a unique and important discovery we really got to see a snapshot into the lives of these individuals who really gave the ultimate sacrifice so that our early doctors here in Utah could be trained appropriately. Um, if you, you think about body donation today, um, these individuals are honored. Um, they're, they're treated with great respect today. And um, because we realize what they're allowing our modern doctors to learn. And, that's what they did in the early 19th, um, the early 20th century, in the early 1900s for our doctors in Utah, these individuals. And so being able to name them and be able to identify them is, is the, one of the last things I think that we can do to show respect for these individuals. Because while it is very interesting that they're, and, and very cool that they were bones found under a building, they are still people. And they're people who lived a life and um, were loved during their life, and when they died, they ultimately, their bodies went to teach our new um, physicians at the time. And so we can honor them and we can learn from them um, by, by looking at their remains. And that is it, thank you so much. And I will turn it over to Holly. All right, thank you all. That was, um, that was a fantastic session. And I think it was a really good example of using different disciplines to understand the past. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, to, for watching. And we hope you join more of our sessions throughout the month. All right.